Okay. Grab a seat. All right. Uh, just a couple of little things. We, we don't have slides today because we just don't have enough announcements. Praise God for that. Uh, Lake Sam small groups, pull out your cafe card type thing here. Okay. Look on the back. You're going to see it. There's the men's book study, which is risk. There's the college group, several different women's studies, the Roman study, men's book study, again on risk, the Bible study. On this side, we've got community interest, knitting, and financial peace. Those are really going well, so get in a financial peace group. Uh, All-age life group, which is awesome group. Spa for the soul, I love that one. Okay, uh, mom's on break, all right? So sign one of these, put it in the offering when it comes around. You're going to have to put your name on here somewhere, but just contact the church. We'll let you know where they are, or they're right here, and just show up, and people will love on you, and we'll go from there, okay? All right. Uh, Jeff Ray, you here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm up here today from the Lake Sands Men's Ministry, which is quickly becoming a place that real men can gather. I know you probably wonder what I mean by that. We had a white elephant gift exchange in December, and we sat around and exchanged gifts, and one of the gifts that was given was a Starbucks card, and we were told to make sure that we gave gifts that were what real men would do. And we all sort of looked and said, why is this a real man's gift? And the answer, which I love, was, it is a man's gift. I didn't think at all about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> So this month, we're taking on another men's tradition, a sport that predates the time of Christ. I've ever seen Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble play this. So we are doing a men's, uh, Lake Sam men's 10-pin showdown next Saturday at 9 a.m. up at Tech City Bowl, which is at 132nd and Northeast 70th. Uh, it is $5.95 cost for two hours of bowling, including your shoes, so you can't beat the deal. There's breakfast available there, including all-you-can-eat pancakes for $3.99. Um, we hope that you come out and join us. It'll be fun. It'll be light. It'll be a chance to throw big rocks down alleys, which has <laughs> got to be a great thing for men to do. Um, I wanted to point out there's a small error on the bulletin. Um, if you think about this, someone caught me on it, which is that the bowling event is on the 21st, and I asked you to RSVP to me by the 24th. So there's something wrong with that. If you could please, if you're planning to come or, uh, or think you're going to come along, please let me know by this coming Tuesday so we can confirm our account. If you don't RSVP and just show up, that's great. But if you're planning to come, we'd love to know just to make sure we have enough lanes reserved. So hopefully we'll see the guys there, and we're looking forward to it. And thank great. you, Kurt. Appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Do know, too, that we are doing the regular study that we do. We're just doing it there, okay? So it's not just bowling. It'll be the regular men's study that we're doing, and, and that'll be great, too. All right. Uh, last thing, go ahead and hit the thing. This is Larry Shocker. There's no music? Oh, that's all right. Uh, all right, Larry Shocker, who many of you know, this is a uh, professional, I mean, been playing piano forever. He plays beautifully, wonderfully. This Friday, he'll be doing a concert based on the last two CDs that he's done. It's going to be great, and, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun and everything else. So, uh, you know, somehow we'll get noise to you at some point in time, and you can hear what it sounds like, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay. Having said that, I th are we good? We headed into sermon stuff right now, so you guys come on up, and then I'm going to introduce these guys in one second. Okay. Now, while they're coming up, go ahead. I want Dave there and Michael there, if you would. Okay. While they're coming up, let me just do a special welcome to people that are streaming today, because I know a lot of you are tuning in right now, and I just want to say, you know, we really have a heart for you here in Bellevue, as it so often happens on the east side. It turns out that the roads here in Bellevue are just completely dry. I mean, they're not even wet and slick. They're just completely dry. And yet, you know, you go five, ten minutes south or five, ten minutes north or south, and you end up with people that are just completely snowed in with a full eighth of an inch of snow in their driveways. <laughs> so I, I, I want you to know that because we feel so badly for you, and knowing that you'll probably be socked in for a week or more, we're taking up a salt drive here today, and we're going to mail salt north and south, and you can put that on your driveway and at least get to your mailbox. Hopefully, there'll be some mail in there, okay? All right, so we just lo we love you, but sit back, you know, grab your coffee, grab your hot cocoa, and enjoy. It's going to be great. All right, now, as you know, we've been doing something, and what we're doing is, is this series, or you may not know because we just started it, but I don't appear to have 
control. There you go. Is your life interesting? And by that, we mean something. We mean, is your life everything that you wanted it to be? And I mean that in the practical sphere and in the spiritual sphere. Because what we're going after in this series is, is that if you'll get it right in the spiritual sphere, if you will go after God in the way that he has asked us to go after him, with the fullness that he has in his heart. Bob Lee, I should have had you up here too. Love you, Bob. Great to have you here. Uh, if, if you're going after him in this way, it leads you to places in God which impact the whole of your life and make it more than is promised in Scripture. They fulfill the words and then some. I mean, this is just the truth of the Christian life. Last week, in order to start this series, we did something called a pest, which is not a pest, but it's apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, and, and shepherds and pastors and teachers. And what we did is, is we saw how every single person in this room is at least one of those in a significant way. These are not just five simple separated out gifts. This is something that the body of Christ is. And we did a sign up of, of, of you know, what are you and what might you be interested in and so on, and it went spectacularly. I mean, people are so buzzed about understanding it differently because here's the truth. When you join God in what he's doing in the way that he's made you to join him, that's where the transformation really starts. When you accept him as Lord and Savior, it makes you new, and that is huge. But I have to say, for the fullness of it to work out, there is this thing that we must do, and that is walk with him. <laughs> and that means actually trust him. That means actually get involved in the things that he's doing in this way that God has said to just trust me. Just walk with me. Trust me. Go after. And when that happens, it is transformative. Now, last week, it was the pro telling you about this. Me as the pastor, I'm paid to tell you good things about God, right? So I know that there's a discount on everything that I say, even though you come here because you trust me, so thank you for that, okay? But I know that there's still a discount. How does this work in my life when I've got such a heavy schedule, such an intense job, such so many other important things going on? And so what I did was, just in prayer, is I started thinking, you know, we need to have real folks, people that have lots of other things going on in their life, to come up and talk, and I could have picked a number of people in this congregation because I didn't want to play favorites. I picked a couple of guys outside of the congregation, okay? These are two guys that are making an enormous difference in our community. I want to introduce you to Michael Johnston and Dave Cole, and would you just right now, would you just <laughs> thank them for being here? Okay. Now, I'm going to introduce just a brief introduction with Michael first. Because several years ago, Michael got it on his heart that the churches in the, on the east side were supposed to be the body of Christ. Not different churches doing different things and never really communicating. You do realize this is not the first place I've ever pastored, and I have never been in a city where there was a really healthy congregant of, congregation or gathering of the pastors. And when I say healthy, I mean not just not threatening and not just not competition and so on, but genuinely love. So Michael had this spectacular idea, which is if we get pastors to just get together, go skiing, snow machining, do some things and everything else, they might actually fall in love with each other. And when they fall in love with each other, when you start with the relationship, what might come out of that? Well, most of you know what's come out of that because you've been hearing me talk about men's events and marriage events and huge things that are going on on the east side, that there are 60 to 80, of, there's probably more than that now, churches on the east side that are getting together and doing these incredible things, and they're not just doing the things that you know about, they're getting the pastors together. Because we fall in love with each other. In fact, let me just tell you how spectacular this is. On August 26th, something is going to happen here that I've never, I guess I've heard about it in one way, but never like this. On August 26th, we're not having church here. We're going to have it in downtown Bellevue at the city park, along with, I don't know how many other churches are going to show up, but a whole bunch of other churches. And we're all going to do one big joint church service in Bellevue Park, which happens to be the day after we will all be at Stevenson like we did last year when we didn't have church and we went and served there instead. We're going to do Stevenson on the 25th. And then on the 26th, we're going to get together and celebrate what God is doing on the east side. I want to say all of this 
and there's just one slight exception that I'll get to in one second. But all of this started because one guy had it on his heart that something should be different than what it is, and I can do something about it. That's how it started. And it's years now later, and the fruit is incalculable already. And it's only just begun. Now, that's Michael Johnston. This is Dave Cole, who most of you know because Bob Lee and Dave Cole have been doing these cool things with roadmaps and all this kind of stuff. Dave Cole, CEO of Coinstar, which most of you would know through Redbox and so on, took it from a $130 million company to a $900 million company. Do you think that he had other responsibilities and duties and things going on in his life? Okay? During that time, as a Christian, both these guys as Christians, he then started going after the Lord, and you're going to hear what his story is. But let me just tell you where he's taken it to. Since that time, he's now retired. And you know one of the things that he does? He meets with me. And who am I? And he meets with me for a substantial amount of time every other week. And I get to talk to him about the most troubling, the most difficult, the, 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 all this kind of stuff. Just, and I mean from personal things to church to leadership to all kinds of things. And Dave has taken me under his wing and is helping me be, be a better leader, be a better person, the whole nine yards. And I just, you know what I mean? I just can't even begin to tell you how much I love these two guys. I mean, I, we, are, we are knit together just as strongly as you could be as I am with you. This is the body of Christ here today. These guys both go to First Pres, which I love that church. Scott Dudley is just doing magnificent things at that church, and it's wonderful. But this is, they, they've given their Sunday to come here and talk to us about their journey in hopes that it will give us a inspiration and a, and a way of finding our way through the thicket of all the other distractions that Satan is putting up and the world is putting up so that we don't get to seeking him first, his kingdom and what it is to be right with him. And then all the other stuff isn't getting added. <laughs> so that's where we're going today. Love you very much. We've got Chantel, who is also here. You're going to hear from her next week along with Brent Christie, another really cool Sunday morning. So would you pray for, I don't know if it's a sermon, but you pray for our time and lift up another church. God, what an honor and a privilege to gather in your name and worship you today. God, it's so amazing to be a part of your commission and your vision for this area and for the world. God, we're so grateful. We're grateful for your presence in our lives and in this church and in this community. And I pray, God, that, that um, the seeds that are already in our hearts to be a part of it and to join you and to experience you would just grow today. And God, I pray for your presence um, and your words to be spoken, God, that Michael and Dave will only speak what, what we need to hear that will inspire us to be a part of your great mission and your great work here. And God, I pray for City Church today, God, that you would just you, bless Jesus. them and what, what they are doing and, and that they would find you today in new ways, God, in real, genuine ways. And I just thank you in Jesus' thank you, name. Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Your guys' turn. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Dave, I'm going to start with you. Uh, just what we're going to do is kind of a three-part thing. I'm just going to say, what, what was it that you were doing? And again, we're starting their journey, not when they came to Christ. We're starting it with, they're a Christian, okay? And they're, they're sitting in church, and they're doing these kinds of things. And just, would you just give us a little background on that? Sure. Well, I started as a... Um, a pew warmer, um, and I was very good at it, and it and it and it, and it, and it gave me um, so much confidence and and a sense of well-being that I was able to make it through the next week, and um, I was very proud of that. Okay, well then I, I I ran into a lady named Nancy Vanderhorn, who was the head of the small group that took me through church orientation and um, we went through six weeks together and she got me to pray and hold hands with other people which I was very uncomfortable <laughs> with and um, pray out loud which I'd never done before and um, 
And she said, meet me on Saturday morning, and I want to talk to you about where you're going to take your faith next. And uh, I didn't want to meet on Saturday morning. I play golf on Saturday mornings. Um, but she was very persistent. So I got there. I showed up. And um, so Nancy said to me, now, Dave, where are you going to take your faith next? And I said, um, I'm too busy, Nancy. And long story short, I said I'm too busy five times. She persisted. So here's a, important. If you're doing this with people, you got to persist, especially <laughs> with hard-headed guys like me, okay? She persisted. She kept saying, no, really, what are you going to do? And I kept saying, I'm too busy. Finally, she said, Dave, what is faith all about to you? And I said, Nancy, it gives me this sense of well-being, and I'm able to make it through the next week. I'm, I have a very hard job. She said, it is so much more than that. I'm thinking, wow, that's some, I just heard something really profound, and I need to discover that. So I gave in, and I said, I, I have a heart for homeless people. I have a heart for people in need. Okay. She said, sign up for the Feed the Hungry team, and you'll be, um, you'll be welcomed. So Nancy and I, my wife Nancy, who is here, we signed up, and we went to Feed the Hungry. Is this too much? No, you're going. Okay. <laughs> so there I learned a couple of things. Uh, one, when you're feeding the hungry, he's actually feeding me. Okay, I'm learning more. I'm getting more out of it than actually I'm giving. Um, but I can't say as I was a great Christian because I'm the kind of guy who um, I read the prodigal son parable and I read about um, the last uh, workers in the vineyard. Um, you know, the people that came in the 11th hour, that's me. Because um, I ran away from God for 32 years. So he, but he caught me from behind in the, in the football uh, language. He caught me from behind. He tackled me and he set straight with me, and I, and I, and I found him. Thank, thank, thank God. Um, so we learned about fellowship there, too, which was really, really critically important, and um, how having people around you in, in fellowship that are strong Christians like Bob Lee, um, like my wife Nancy, that really changes you. You need people around you, okay? Um, and, and so that was an incredibly important experience. And then there was another experience, which was, you know, sort of the intellectual and the heart um, accepting the Lord and understanding what he built me to be and understanding what I had built myself to be was different. And there was a big gap, a big gap. And it wasn't a good gap. And... He taught me who he wanted me to be through um, a lot of different vehicles. But um, now I think I'm going to pause it right there because I want Michael to, to hit his part, and then I'm going to come back and be thinking about how to describe the actual experiences and what it felt like, and so on. But Michael, you're up. So, like Dave, I was a I was a pew warmer as well. But the, the only difference is that and we didn't know each other. But I would sit behind Dave, and when he slept. <laughs> it, it provided cover for me so that I could also lower my head. Um, now I was, um, I've been a, a, a Christian my whole life um, and uh, you know, it wasn't until about 10 years ago and I'll talk about that I'm sure at some point later but the, um, I didn't really realize what I was was a cultural Christian. I, um, I think I lived it more as an insurance policy uh, than, than anything else. And I, on Sundays, uh, frankly, it was kind of um, a, a duty to go to church. It was, I, I tried to, frankly, get in and out as fast as possible. Um, uh, last night I asked my wife, I said, so honey, what, you know, how would you describe these things? And she, uh, she goes, well, do you really, you know, we've talked about a lot of these things and every, every time. It's not that flattering to you. <laughs> and, and, she, and she reminded me one time, she goes, well, remember how I used to, because you never slept during the week because of work, and I used to let you sleep in the morning, and 
Um, you know, I woke, would wake you up the last minute before church, and, and you would um, pop up and say, why isn't everybody ready then? And then you'd get uh, upset and actually leave ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd tell me that's, that way you could get back from church earlier, too. That, that was it. So I, um, uh, although I thought I was a Christian and I believed, um, the rest of the week also was a week I, I, um, I certainly wasn't... Um, living it, and I think I got my identity in, in just about everything else. Everything else that the world and culture um, taught me. I mean, I think when I, when I think about the really three most important aspects of my life and, and um, the priorities of time was work, I really got my identity in the success of my work and, and building a net worth. I'm in the hedge fund industry, which is pure capitalism, and I just, um, that was my focus, uh, six really, I'd say 6.75 days of the week since church, you know, and, uh, <laughs> it's only a part of that Sunday. Um, you know, it, I, I think my uh, identity with my wife uh, was more about what I could provide her. I, um, you know, if I could provide her the next nice house, that next car, uh, nice vacations, it was, um, that was really that was really my focus and, and priority in, uh, of, our, of our relationship. And then as a father, um, uh, frankly, I, I think that uh, when they were young, it was about, you know, the cute little family. And, you know, I just, it was important for my daughter to wear the cute little Mickey Mouse dresses and on Easter and Christmas, the velvet dresses. And it was all about cute, cute, cuteness of the, the cute little family. And then as they got older, it was about, how they were doing on the sports field, and if I was a coach, you know, I thought a good father was gonna would be a coach. You know, if I'm coaching the kids, I'm giving them some time. Um, if you ask them now, I wasn't. I also had a BlackBerry in my hand, and I was sitting. You know, I'd, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be working while I was with them constantly. It was also the same thing. Taking them on the next better vacation was how I, um, you know, prioritized myself as a father. And then it, it started to be. Which college would they go to? So how, do, how were they doing in school? That's how I was measured as a dad. And so I think that um, really, to, to sum it up, I think I was on this kind of self-actualization or, or Michael Johnston um, self-betterment program with the emphasis on Michael Johnston. So I forgot to do something. I want to tell you something. We want to field at least some of your questions so you can... You can just go, is the QR code in there too? If you're really smart and good with your phone, there's a little thing in your packet that you can just take a picture and it'll take you right to your text message in the right place and then you just put in LSF, you don't have to capitalize it, and then a space and then type in your question. And they'll be fielding those back there and they'll be sending them up here to me and I'll be peppering those into their conversation. So as you have questions and so on, do you get it? That'll be sitting up there the whole time, okay? So you can just go to your text too. You don't actually have to use the QR code, but it's cool, so we're trying it, okay? All right, so, so that's where you are. Uh, what happened, and in specific terms, what happened that actually got you to this totally different life that you're now leading? So I... Um Again, as a cultural Christian, and, and, and everything about my life was focused on other things. Um, I think to the world standards, I was, it was, uh, everything was pretty, you know, I looked uh, like a success. I did have a, uh, this wonderful looking family. Um, I was doing very well at my job. Um, I was going on these great trips and had any car I wanted, all, you know, all these things. And so I looked like a, a real success. The reality is, uh, inside, I was always, uh, there was something different there. And so what happened to me was in, in uh, 2001, my brother passed away. Um, I didn't have a great relationship for, with my brother because uh, he had alcohol and drug problems. And I was on this, part of my self-improvement program was to, to kind of separate myself from that and to not, to not let our lives overlap. Uh, didn't want my kids to see it. And so... Um, didn't really have a great relationship with him, but it really, it hit me, hit me hard. And, and then I had two friends die in 9-11, one whom I actually spoke to that morning. Um, obviously, I, I deal with Wall Street, so what, uh, one of my salesmen uh, working for Cantor Fitzgerald, Mark, was, um, I spoke to that morning, and uh, he literally died 15 minutes later, or that's when the strike was. Um, 
So after this, really what was a pretty good life from, uh, except for all the hidden things, um, I kind of went into this period where I was really down. I was, um, uh, I just wasn't, wasn't the same and I didn't have uh, the excitement and got to the point where I, I realized I was actually depressed for the first time in my life um, for more than five minutes. <laughs> so, um, uh, for whatever reason, I started to um, uh, I started to get worried about it, and I uh, one day I got down on my knees next to my bed. It was a day I actually had a little trouble getting out of bed to go to work because uh, actually at that time my my business was not doing so well either, and I just prayed to God. I I, I confessed to God that I had no control of my life because I was again on this self betterment program. It was all about control. It was what I thought was important and. Um, Asked, asked Jesus to take control of my life. And I proceeded to do that a lot for the next uh, week or several weeks. And then I just felt this, this real kind of lift off my shoulders. Um, the the, the, the kind of low feeling was going away, but it was even more than that. I felt this incredible warmth. I felt this peace. I, I felt this the shame I had. Um, from my own behavior and my family's behavior, I just felt that lifting. Um, it just, it was this incredible uh, feeling, profound change in me that I had never felt in my life. And I really um, didn't know uh, that it would take a surrender. I, I actually surrendered, uh, realizing that I had no control in my life. That it, it, that's what it took, I think, for, for really the Holy Spirit to show up, and I experienced the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life, and that was crazy good. Do you already love him now? <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Dave just, just to keep it bouncing back and forth, but I really want to get to, you know, so, so Dave, you're in, this, you're in this place, and you're pew sitting, and, and so on. Nancy's come to you, and she's talked to you about the various things and everything else. Can you just describe, I'm really looking for what it felt like as you were doing, you know, what were you actually doing and what was it doing to you in a specific way? And I'm really looking for that transition, you know, where all of a sudden you start going, oh my gosh, there really is more here. Well, um, it, I used to go, I used to drive home every night and I would assess how well I did on my job that given day. And that was the whole focus I started with thing, certain things to do in the morning. I'd work 10, 12 hours. I'd come home, and I'd, on the way home, say, how did you do? And I started to realize that is, that is really hollow, really hollow. There's this meaninglessness to what I, what I was doing in a lot of ways. And um, my sister, Chris, who wonderfully um, spiritual, sold-out-to-God person, sent me this book called um, Max Lucado's, um, now I can't think of it. I'm 64 years old, and um, <laughs> I have this impaired mind uh, and memory. Um, and, and I re still read it every day. So, um, but the point was, it started with a message on the fruit of the Spirit. And then and you had a daily reading. And... Um, I decided I was going to read the fruit of the Spirit every day in the morning, and then I was going to try to live in the Spirit. Try. Really hard. I started to realize, there are so many sins in your life, man, you don't, you don't have any idea. Um, every time I think about myself, I truly think about the motives I had, I would be, wow, I've, I have so far to go. Um, but it was really good for me because instead of the work stuff, I'm thinking about the fruit of the Spirit, which actually helped my work, by the way. I became a lot better leader and, and, a, and a lot better person. And um, it was, I think it was the moment that I decided to do that that was the, was the telling point when I realized I have to change. I have to change. And in order to accept the Lord, I have to live Try to live the way the Lord lived. So then, on a practical level, what did you start doing and what effect did it start having on you? 
Well, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I had to do those things. And, and instead of um, getting angry because somebody didn't deliver the numbers or whatever, it was to love them and understand them and, and care for them. And um, instead of uh, giving them a tough performance review, I, did, I spoke the truth in love. Um, and um, that, you know, being in myself um, was so insecure. Um, it was full of fear, okay? Uh, yeah, I looked like a bulletproof guy on the outside, and I was mushy and, and, and uh, in, in great fear, moment to moment, about was I, was I, was I really doing this job? Was it, but it became living in love, okay? And, and that's the big difference. And, and so the fear kind of got pushed away, and the fact that the Lord had reached me and was, was now using me even in a, uh, you know, a corporate world and a corporate role was very fulfilling. And I, and, I, and I felt this sense of great peace and well-being about it. I love this, and I want to point something out, and that is, you hear on both of them, we haven't even gotten to the place yet where they're starting to do the things that, that Dave is doing with Jubilee Reach and the things that Michael is doing that are making such a difference and bringing them so much joy and abundance in their life. We really started where the gospel actually starts with it, right? It's not in the doing that was, it's, you can do things, and that's not the point. <laughs> The point was is that they were trying to have an encounter with the real God, that they were starting to have this moment where they were going after him. And I, I love it because works mentality is trying to get God's approval by what you do. There's a no, more subtle form of that, and that is if I do something, then everything is going to be better. And they are doing something, but it's not the, it's not the thing that we're going towards as we go to the, in the rest of it, the actual practical things that they're doing. It's in, their, it's in their walk, it's in their hearts, it's in their minds that they're starting to go, there's something else going on here and they're starting to look for it. So, going from the sort of abstract of feeling to now you start putting your hand to something. What, what did you start doing and again, what effect did it start having on you? Well, the, um, I mean, if you heard what Dave just, what, the, the fruits of the spirit, think about the story of my wife telling me she'd wake me up late and I would rush off to church before him. Think about the lack of patience, lack of kindness, <laughs> lack of love, lack of faithfulness. I mean, um, fairly horrendous. And, and she, uh, she was going to come here today, but the, uh, our nine-year-old nine had different ideas. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, and then you'd see her. I, I call us Beauty and the Beast. So when you, when you see her, you'd also say, how could she have stuck with that guy? <laughs> Um, the, the, the reality is, is when I, once I got a taste of this, it was like I came alive, it was like I was alive for the first time, actually, and it was, it was like the living water, and, and I, and I just wanted more of it, I wanted more of God, and I kind of, I, I thought about it in terms of when I first met my wife, um, and again, I mean, the reality is that I was this, I was this guy that had a lot of stuff a lot of baggage inside, and I saw my I saw my wife, and I, I just instantly I was I was taken by her, and I, I wanted her, so I, I started I pursued her with such whimsical um, energy that I mean I would do anything. I uh, uh, one of our first lunches um, I, I got I realized that I could make her laugh, and laughing um, was one of the things that. Because uh, the rest of the package wasn't so good, so I thought I'm gonna make her laugh, and that'll, that'll get her. So, so I would do things like I would uh, at this lunch. I went, so I'll go get her some ice cream cones. I went and got one, and I was making sure she was watching. I'd pretend to fall and put it on my forehead, and I mean, just absolutely ridiculous things. And yeah, T 25 years of marriage, my friend. Uh, yeah. He said, uh, "Did that work?" Yeah. I did other things. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but trying to get her to laugh was, was one of them. And it was just, but it was this pursuit. And I think that any, any of us that are married, and you, when you, you first you know, find that attraction to your wife, I mean, you, we've got that in us. We are, we are built to pursue like that. And it just became, 
you know, the way I started thinking is that's how I'm supposed to pursue God every day of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, but but it, it was also as that was happening, uh, it became so extraordinarily real to me because up to that point, like my bi my uh, praying, for instance, you know, I had a I had prayer life, but it was relatively weak. And I'd say say if I really had to sum it up, it was whenever I was in trouble, I was asking like, if if you get me out of this one, I promise. From here on out, I'll be good. And I, I don't know how many times I had that prayer with him, but it was too many. And the Bible, I tried to read the Bible uh, for the first 40 years of my life. And quite frankly, I never really read it. I'd get into it, and I, I couldn't even. Um, it, was, it was just kind of the Old Testament was bizarre to me, and the New Testament, I, I just, it, was, it never captured me. And so it was after this surrender that everything came alive. But when I went to church, the sermons came alive. I started to look over his shoulder instead of being behind him, crashed down. <laughs> I was looking over his But it was, like, it was like God was talking to me through every single sermon. It's when I looked at the Bible, um, the words c came out. And it was, uh, it was, you know, I was the last guy in the world that would want to be considered a born-again Christian. But the reality was, like in John 3.3, 3, when, when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. And I started seeing the kingdom of God in everything. And it was just, I mean, it's fascinating beyond words. And um, everything just changed. I mean, and when he, when he made the living water, it was like it was literally flowing inside of me. And um, I'm, I'm going to do something yeah. because when you talked about prayer, and we're, I still want to get to some place that yeah. we're not quite getting to yet. But I, I just want to, when you said about prayer, you just started going, yeah. <laughs> what was that? Um, well, prayer initially to me was 30 seconds a day uh, at work, uh, getting my day started. And it was the most shallow stuff I'd, you know, I, and, it, and it turned into 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and 30 minutes. Um, and because I have such an active mind and I'm always going off in these tangents, uh, we went away to the California desert for 60 days, and I got this real strong message, you know, I want, I want some serious prayer out of you, and, and by the way, um, Nancy and I, we've been married 40, 40 years, and um, she said to me when I retired, um, no major commitments for six months, I know you. <laughs> and we're going away for 60 days, two months. And I said, how about two weeks? <laughs> no, it's going to be two months. So we compromised. We went away for 59 days. <laughs> <laughs> and he's supposed to be the good negotiator. It's February and March. <laughs> February and March, so... February shorter, so you got right. There, right. <laughs> so you still felt like you won. <laughs> right. Right. Big win for the guy. That guys. was really good of you, Nancy. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. So anyway, in the sixty days, um, there was nothing to do. What am I going to do? Well, I started reading the Bible. I started really getting into the Word, and I happened across Elisha, and uh, he has this. He asked the Lord for to double his faith. I think, wow, that's a pretty neat thing. I could, that's what I'm going to ask the Lord for. Anyway, we have this, this sort of dialogue, and then it, it's, okay, what did I uniquely design you to do? And I'm going, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. And then this question came in my mind. When you had a great day, what did you do? I was, wow, that's interesting. You know what, I always, I always feel good when I help someone, you know? Um, and and um, so that kind of led to a new life, which was, um, and, he, and he said to me, you know, I put you through uh, incredible trials and suffering and success and failure and this and that, and um, I want you to help people. I want you to help leaders who are going through the same stuff. Wow, that's neat. I could do that. I, could, I think I could do that. Um, so that, that started a life for me that was very fulfilling. It was like I felt the Lord in me and, and working through me. 
And I'd say things in these meetings that I wouldn't even know I knew. So obviously it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Uh, it was him. And that continues to happen all the time. Um, now, at this point in time, so that you'll understand what Dave does, and Nancy, we love you. Everybody's going to have a big heart for you now. Now, you're not only <laughs> mentoring me, but you've got a number of other people. You're the head of essentially the board now, or, I said, or whatever it is, and if I get the wording wrong, you guys help me, because they're still reworking it. But there was Linking Shields, the men's events that Michael started, and then there was Jubilee Reach, which is Jubilee, and Mike and Brent and Chantel will be here next week talking about Jubilee. But the bottom line is, is that they've, they've come together to be one organization, because they thought, just like churches are different, we need these all under one umbrella, and it's a very good idea, and I think it was started in part by you and you. So, but bottom line, so how many, let's just, let's just do it this way. You're retired. How many, day, how many hours a day are you now working for Jubilee as, as the board member, meeting with people that are mentoring and the whole nine yards? Well, I, I work uh, four days a week, um, eight to 10 hours a day. Um, I take Wednesday off, I take Saturday off, and Sunday's the Sabbath. So, um, but it's great work. It's great adventure. It's fun. Uh, Tell me about that. The, the difference between what you're doing now in this work at Jubilee and what you were doing, say, at Coinstar. Give us some sense of how it's different in your heart. Okay, so the work at Coinstar was duty. You know what duty is? <laughs> <laughs> duty. I, I have to do this. I'm paid to do this. I owe the organization this. Uh, duty is not fun. And, I, and, I, and one of the young fellows that I mentor, who's 27, said to me three weeks into the work I was doing with him, you don't have enough joy in your life, Dave. So, wow. He said, I'm talking to the Lord about you, and you don't have enough joy in your life. But anyway... <laughs> the joy came, and the peace came, and the, and, the, and, the, and the great adventure came as the duty got pushed out of my life, and the, the Lord took over. And with all of that, what I do, which I love to do, I get up more excited about life every day in my new life. Uh, I get to do the dishes for Nancy. Um, you know, I, like Michael, I not only slept in church, I slept at home, too. And, and um, you know what? She showed me Jesus uh, for 40 years. Um, there was the model, um, and I didn't, I didn't see it for a long time. So. Maybe we should be, next time we do this, I'll have the wives come up, yeah. and then they'll say, <laughs> you know. They can affirm but, everything we've but said. I, I, yeah, I just want to go after some. it. We're coming back to you in one second, Michael, but I just want to press this just one more, one more level. Um, just the joy. You know, I, I get that he's saying you need more joy because you're still working hard and doing all that kind yeah. of stuff, but just, I, I'd love you just to talk about, you know, what it feels like as you went from doing the things that you were doing in the world to the things that God was leading you to do that were kingdom-minded? Well, it's like you have this whole new sense of direction and power, and you're doing things... Well, I always love to see great teams succeed beyond their wildest dreams, beyond their humanity. And, boy, that's happening in spades all around our middle school program, Jubilee Reach. I get, to, I get to deal with people who are truly saints, and I'm not one of them, but um, truly saints. And, and to see them achieve things that they didn't think they could ever achieve, it could only be God showing up, his presence. And I'm part of that. I'm part of that. I'm, an, I'm part of that adventure, which is... Um, it's beyond um, fabulous, great. There's no word to describe it. It's just exhilarating. Thank you, Lord. Michael, um, he shows up. I have a, 
I, you know, I didn't want to be part of this board. I didn't want to be the chair of the board. And the reason I didn't want to hear a bunch of old white men talk and listen to themselves. That's what a board does, typically. Um, <laughs> I'm an old white man, by the way. Um, You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this, this board is for sold out you're a middle-aged white man. Uh, <laughs> sold out to the Lord, trying to do what the Lord wants us to do, not what we want to do. And it's so wonderful to be part of that. Amen. And, and um, you know, the, but the thing I do is I, all I do is I'm a caddy. I'm a, I'm, you guys, anybody play golf here? Yeah, yes. a couple of you. Well, caddies really carry the bag. They help the player think about shots, and then they give them positive affirmation. Um, and it's really, really fun to do that and to be part of somebody's life. And to so it. with Dave, what we've got is somebody who went from, and you were starting to do some things before you retired from Coinstar. Correct. And I know that because he was featured in one of the men's events that we had as the guy who was speaking, and he was already talking about the major transformation that was taking place in his life. But I'm trying to listen with the ears of people that are sitting here with, you know, in your case, two sets of twins, you know, other people that are, that are looking at, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours worth of work and ship periods and so on. And, and how could you possibly, you know, it's one thing, okay, you're retired, Dave, and so you can do that. Michael, you're not retired. <laughs> and yet, here you are giving enormous amounts of time and energy and thought and process. And again, I, I want to say Dave was doing this too. He was transitioned long before he retired to this style of life, to this interesting life that we're going after. But I would love for you to just deal with, you know, uh, in a practical way, how do you make it fit? <laughs> it's hard. I mean, I... Uh, I'm not retired, but I'm really close to becoming unemployed. I, I think I'm getting ready to get fired from the company I work, I own. I mean, <laughs> it's my company, and it's, uh, yeah, I'm not kidding. So um, I just, uh, you know, again, I mean, I, I was so radically transformed and, and, and saw everything uh, through a different prism, through a different lens when this happened to me. Um, you know, um, my, it, it's really, my, where, where's the pri what are the priorities in, in your heart? I mean, I told you the priorities before when I was, you know, I was a Christian, but the priorities now are entirely different. Um, you know, when I first, uh, when this first happened, I just wanted to write checks to everything because this is God's money, and I just wanted to write checks to everything. And so that instead of chasing net worth, I just wanted to give it, give it away really, really quickly. Um, and uh, you know, my wife and others said, "Well, the way you're, you know, the way you're doing it might not be. Uh, you don't just have to give it all away. Um, you actually have to think about it some and, and things." And, you know, the way I thought about my wife, I mean, it was just, it was incredible how, how that changed and how I viewed my job as leader, the leadership in the family. And then my only priority for my children is for them to fall in love with Jesus Christ. I mean, that's it. I don't care what college they go to. I don't care which jobs they get. Um, that is it. And so, so when everything changed, um, it also... Uh, I mean, I was just, I wanted this to, I wanted everyone to experience this. And so it just, um, I mean, if I could run through the streets and scream, Jesus is crazy about you, he's crazy about you, crazy about you guys. No, it's, 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 it's different, you just got to try this, it's incredible. And I just, I mean, so I had this desire for everybody to know. And then when, when uh, you know, I, I feel God put those ideas in my head, because when I really looked at it, I said, well, most people out there aren't seeing the real Jesus. And, you know, I looked, at, I looked at the church, and I said, well, the church seems to be really good in the holy huddle behind their walls. But nobody, you know, I kept saying, let's go to, let's go to Bell Square. That's the center of culture in this, in this community. Let's go to Bell Square and ask people, how do you see Jesus in the church? And these things just kept popping in my head, and I was really confident that 
the answer, we, I don't see Jesus in the church, I, you know, and, and I think we all have a pretty good idea of what a lot of people, how they feel about Christians. I mean, look at the Tebow story. There's people that love them and rooting for them, and there's all these that don't, they're so adamant against Christians, they don't see Christ in Christians. And it was, so I said, so just, that's why the, that first Montana trip, just read, let's bring the leaders together, and what if we actually focused on the things that we agree on? And so it just became everything about, me, everything that uh, I was passionate about was about, when, when you think, and I know that you love what you do. I mean, I know I've heard you talk about the, the, you know, the kinds of things that you get to do because you've yeah. worked yourself into a place to where you really do get to do the things that you like to do and that are, you're very gifted at and so on. And I know that you get a great joy out of those things and they're worldly endeavors, good investments and good for your clients and yeah. good for your, your partners and so on. But bottom line, would you contrast that joy you know, in some tangible way, maybe tell a story or something, but, you know, contrast that joy with when you're doing the things of the kingdom, and again, you know, in a working situation. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, uh, there's no comparison. I'm already, I've contrasted my old life and then my new life, and there's, um, you know, one of the things that became also very clear to me is this, this need to continuously be on guard against self. Um, it was through surrender uh, you know, and he tells us, if you want to have a relationship with them, you've got to lay down your life. And I, I, I'd never heard that part until I actually s surrendered it. And so I'm constantly wanting to continue to surrender uh, because I, I, was, I get off track <laughs> a lot and I get pulled back into, into self. And I do like, I love my job. I, lo I love uh, investing in companies and seeing them and, uh, and winning. Uh, and so meaning they go up a lot in value and, 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 you know, I still do. I, I like that that big payday at the end of the year. It's it's so so I am still drawn to that. But there's no comparison to. I am a miracle of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt. In my life. I, he surrendered me from myself. And so whenever I go, everything else I'm doing when it's when it's kingdom minded, I'm just meeting other miracles. And when you meet other miracles, he becomes that much more real. And and. I mean, when you, and, and if you really put it into perspective, this is, this is the God that made everything. I mean, and so I just keep, that's what I, I focus on, and, and I, I never had real peace. I never had, I mean, I had happiness. I mean, I, you can create, I manufactured happiness with going to, uh, you know, you go to Maui, and then next year's Maui is the next better hotel, and I can manufacture happiness, but I can never manufacture this, this incredible satisfaction with experiencing the, the, the love of the world. I mean, and it just, um, so every time, and then, and I'm also, to get away from self, I was, uh, and I'm, I'm also always on guard about what is me or an institution versus what's really him, and, and trying to find out where is he moving to be in him to remove me from it. And, you know, I, I just, I get great comfort whenever something happened, which is exactly opposite. I never saw it could possibly happen. And that, when we talk about Jubilee Reach, never expected these things it to go this way. And so you know it's God. It's not about anybody on the board or any, it's, it's about God. And it's really, really um, clear. And I mean, it's just, whenever that happens, uh, I mean, some examples in this, in this, since this has all happened, my wife started going to Rwanda, and she became the board of this ministry in Rwanda, and she'd come back, and all these, we'd be together with, talking to people, and they'd say, well, Michael, when are you going to Africa? I'd say, oh, I'm never going to Africa. There's no, there's no chance you'll get me to Africa. And why? Nah, just, I'm not comfortable going to Africa. Um, well, I've been to Africa a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, those... And, I mean, these guys know the last thing you could ever imagine, if you knew me even five years ago, I would never uh, public, I couldn't speak publicly. I, I, could, I could write it in my head for 24-7 for a week, and then I'd get there and I'd be, <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't come out of me. So, I mean, this, these are, it's, to me, it's, it's just all, there's so much evidence when you're moving with him um, and it's him, and it's just where I want to be, and it's, uh, um, it's, he, he's placed it so deeply in my heart that this really is a rescue mission. This is, we are in a battle for souls, 
There is extraordinary urgency. It's life and death. It's life and death in our family. Um, I've got, you know, because of the dysfunctional family I have, I've, I've had a lot of, you know, I separated myself from my family. And my, I can tell you my younger sister is the last one. I basically, I fought it. I wasn't going to go there. And four months ago, God got me to jump into that. And it's a mess. And it's a beautiful mess. Um, yeah. I, I, there's, there's private things that I can't share. That, you know, we're friends and we talk and so on. Uh, and it wouldn't be okay for me to share them. But I just want you to know that you've heard my story, most of you. And um, I have a, such a kinship with Michael because I hear him wrestling in the exact same way as what when I came alive, I wrestled with having money and having things. I wrestled with it because I understood the benefit, the responsibility, the blessing, but also the cost, the, the, the challenge. You know, God says something extraordinary. He said, he, God loves marriage. It's the way that we learn on the horizontal to become one with one another. And yet he says, you know, if you can understand it, it's actually better if you don't get married because then it can be all about. He says it's harder for a rich person to get in the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And you'll hear people do these, these long talks about how to make that okay. God didn't mean to make it okay. He meant to make it really difficult. He meant to say that there's a lot that's going on there and there's a lot of things on it. He's not saying it's impossible. God's a God of miracles. What he's saying is, is it's a different life. It's a different thing. And I just want to say, I, I, when I talk to you and I hear these and he's wrestling with it and we talk, I just can't tell you, my heart leaps with joy because the story of coming to Christ is so similar. It always has different circumstances. It always has its unique fingerprint. But its pattern, its journey, always tracks there is this joy, this excitement, this overflowing, this thing that takes place, and all of a sudden, you see everything different. All the stuff that you have, and all the stuff that it meant, and everything that you were about, it becomes different. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're getting into this other space, and now you can't wait to do other things. And I would say, Dave, would you just tell us, one of the things that we're doing here for this month is we're, we're asking people to sign up to do things. And this week we're asking them to continue on this APES thing of are you an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, and so on. And, and where does that connect and where would you like us to contact you so that you can get involved in something that has a chance of taking us out of where we are and into the place that God has made us to be so that we can begin to experience this and come alive. So... Help me out here, Dave. Help a brother out. Throw him a bone. What would, you, what would you say to these incredible people about what it is to get involved, what it is to really start giving your time and your energy? You get the drift. Yeah. Well, I think it's to listen to God. And uh, in my case, God talked to me about Jubilee Reach and said, go ask Brent Christie how you can help him. I didn't do that right away, to be honest with you. Uh, it took a few months, and then I hid behind the six-month deal, you know. <laughs> but, but in January of 2010, Scott Dudley preached a sermon and said, it's very simple. All you do is take the one next little step God's telling you to take. Of course, that was, I wasn't totally sleeping through that whole service. It was actually, I was awake <laughs> for the sermon. Oh, no, that was the old days. <laughs> That's right. That's we we both woke up. Right, right. <laughs> anyway, I, I said to myself, yeah, I could probably do that. I walk out of the service. Immediately to my right stands Brent Christie. That wasn't an accident. I said to him, Brent, I'm kind of hearing God say to me, maybe there's a way I can help you. Could I help you in some way? And he goes, oh, man, he gave me one of those bear hugs. Well... You know, he'll practically suffocate you with a, with a Brent Christie bear hug. And I'm thinking, wow, this, this guy's powerful. Anyway, he said, could we meet tomorrow, which was Monday. I said, yeah, sure, sure. And anyway, that's how it started. So all I did was take one little step. And then that led to another thing and another thing and another thing and another thing. And, and um, at every point, I felt this sense of affirmation, of joy, of peace, of now I'm really, you know, 
doing what God wants me to do. And, and it was, um, yeah, I did that, a lot of that on my job, but this was truly what he wanted me to do. And honestly, I felt Jubilee Reach. Uh, Nancy and I had an adopted foster child son, which was a very, the toughest experience of our whole lives. And I didn't want to get back into that kind of mess. And I, I was afraid. But he got me past that fear. Yeah, this, you know, I just, uh, the reality is, I mean, I think God will point us all in the right direction as to what we do. The, the reality is, and we're told, that the enemy wants to devour every one of us and our children. And if you look around, that's really what he's doing. I mean, the, the, the depression and anxiety, and you hear that 15 to 20 percent of the kids in this country are cutting themselves to deal with the pain. Um, when you really, when I started getting out there into this community, I saw things, a lot of things that I believed, but not, it wasn't until I saw it that it was kind of like he hit me over the head with a hammer. Um, you know, my kids have all gone on to, to schools in, on the west side of the 405, and you, you just got a lot of beautiful people, you got, you know, eight, uh, type A personalities all achieving great things. They are, those kids are dying. They're, they're dying everywhere. Um, he wants, he want, the enemy wants us in this, uh, that cultural world that I was living in. I know those lies really well, and that's what's being told to our kids, even our kids in church. The other six days of the week, they're being told things that aren't true. I don't care how pretty you are, you're never going to feel pretty enough. I don't care how rich you are, you'll never feel rich enough. I mean, it's just these are all, you know, I don't care how smart you are, you'll never feel smart enough. Every, and that's what every kid, because they're not, they don't all, they're not all the smartest, prettiest. But even though it's just, they, they're, they're really, they're not satisfied. Um, just like I wasn't satisfied. And we all know, every one of us knows what it takes. And, it, and he told us how to do this, and it's love your neighbor. It's how, it's how we, if we love our neighbor, people will get the chance to see the real Jesus Christ. Um, and let me tell you, before this happened to me, I couldn't even say Jesus Christ. I just wanted to tell you, I was blocked from actually being able to say Jesus Christ. Isn't that kind of weird? But it's true. And... When you get out there, it's, um, when you ask me, in many ways, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, I, am, uh, I am way over my skis on time. I'm way over my skis on everything. Um, but I don't feel um, like there's, there's been any greater purpose in my entire life. And it starts with myself, as, you know, continuing to let him rescue me and, and then my family. And I just can't ignore all those all those kids out there in particular, you know, one of the beauties of this church is you've got Stevenson and Odal, mm -hmm. and it's just, um, they're there, and, they're, and they're, they are suffering greatly, and there are so many needs that can be answered through Jubilee Reach, through you guys, through, you know, to, to deliver them the truth. This is just too of 50 people that I could have brought up. I bring these two up because, uh, you know, I just love them with everything I've got because I, I, I listen to them and I hear them and I can't help but just fall hopelessly in love and just think these are the most wonderful people ever. But the truth is I want to say something and I, I really mean this and I want you to just let it sink in for a second. They're just a symptom. God is, in fact, moving. There are things that are happening that need, these guys, even with their considerable horsepower and the other people who are involved with them, could have never done. You will hear next week stories of the degree to which the public schools have opened up to the ministry that they're doing and this church is doing in the community. And I'm telling you, this is so far beyond what anybody could have thought or imagined was going to happen. When we started Jubilee Reach and when you got the guys together and when Jubilee Reach bought the building and we went and helped them do it and all that kind of stuff, when all of this kind of stuff unfolded, nobody had the faintest inkling of what's now happening. We did the next step. 
It was, if it had been just that, it would have been good. <laughs> it would have been better than good. It would have been great. But we did the next step. And then God said, oh, you're serious? Oh, let me open another door for you. Let me open another door for you. Let me open another door. That's what these guys' life have become. That's what a lot of people's lives at their age and in their circumstance are going through. But it isn't just them and their age and their circumstance. It's everybody. It's the way that this church came alive. It's just like last week when we did the APES thing and we're just about to do it again for those who didn't get a chance to do it. We've never had people just come alive with the ideas and the thoughts and the creativity and the potential of, of what it might be. I'm telling you, I think it is an extraordinary time when the world goes through difficulty. God has always put the church through it first so that we're already coming out of the difficulty. We've been reshaped, remolded, transformed into a new way so that we are the ones who are in position to take advantage of the things that he's doing that we still haven't even yet seen. This is what is actually happening on the east side. Michael has an incredibly powerful vision that he shared with us the first time he got together because it was actually my question. He brought us together. We were all sitting in a very nice place and, and we were talking and we were saying, why are we here? And he said, I don't know. You know, we should do something. <laughs> and everybody was kind of going, well, what? You know, I mean, a bunch of pastors don't know each other. What are you going to say? You know, and all this kind of stuff. And it just occurred to me about founding spirits and about God moving through anointed leaders. And I just said, what's on your heart to do? What would you like to do? And he said, well, I don't want to really talk because I want you guys to come up with it, but, but here's what burns in my heart. And he said, men, marriages, and children. He said, I just can't even begin to tell you, this is just consuming my life. Men, marriages, and children. Everybody went, that sounds good. <laughs> that sounds about right. Let's do something. And for years now, things have been happening, and it's taken us to places that we could have never seen. Again, next week, another follow-up. It'll be, it won't, this is, I wanted you here to hear the journey in an individual life of how you get to the transformed place to make your life interesting. Next week, we're going to be telling you inspirational stories about what God is doing in our community that I'm telling you, it, it, it'll knock your socks off. You'll just say, I just can't even believe that this is happening in the way that it's happening. It's, it's extraordinary. This is our moment. This is our time. If we say yes, we will look back 10 years from now and we will say, that was the most incredible time of my life. We will be standing before people telling stories of our journey and the incredible transformation that took place in our life, how much better it was than anything we ever knew or thought about. If we don't say yes, and I don't, I'm not, this isn't, you know me, I'm not a guilt guy, right? But if we do not say yes, I do want to make something clear. It's all going to change. The door is open. I feel this so strongly in my heart, and these guys know because I tell them this all the time, and I to the point where they say, quit telling us that because we know it's true. But the door is open right now for a reason, and here's the reason. God wants to see what we will do. Will we say yes? Will we put our money where our mouth is? Will we put our feet where our mouth is? Will we put our heart where we know it's supposed to be? If we will, I think the things that God will do, will, <laughs> it'll, it'll, make, it'll make everything you've ever known about God seem silly, no matter where you are. If we don't, I think we'll die going, my life really never was what I thought it could be. Mm -hmm. the, the goal of this sermon series is to get us to the place that is surpassing because it's what he promised. Now, if we don't want to come along, okay. If we do, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Do me this in your packets. First of all, you know what, before we do this, let me get these guys off so they don't have to be awkward right now. I wanna thank you guys for giving a Sunday, giving your time. I wanna thank you guys for giving your lives to this community. Thank you, love you, man. Love you, brother, love you. Dave, you can't ever get close to me. <laughs>
All right, in your packets, and thanks ushers for being ready with it, in your packets is this, okay? That's, there's a database info on the top. If you did not fill this out last week, and many of you did, like I say, I think everybody that was here did, so if you weren't here, just raise your hands, just get one, and, and put the database information up top so that we have current information on you, okay? And then, if you don't get quite what this is, you can look on the back of your note sheet for the today, and it'll tell you the descriptions we're using, because you'll say, if you weren't here last week, I'm not an apostle, I'm not a prophet, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a shepherd, and I'm not a teacher. After you listen to the sermon, after you read those descriptions, you'll say, it turns out I am clearly a one of these, and I'm very strongly also one of these, and I might even be one of those, right? And what we're asking you to do is put whatever you think you are most of, one, two, three, four, five, right? You don't have to do all five, just do the ones that you, you would say. Look on the back of your notes, you know what I'm talking about? And if you, again, if you don't know what I'm doing, and just read those descriptions because they're very different descriptions than what you would think of these things, okay? And if they witness with you, then put one and two on the first one and the second one, and then just like you did, you know, when you were in grade school, draw a line to some ministry that you're interested in being involved in. Now, one big change, one big addition for even somebody who signed up last week too. If you've been thinking about this this week and you've got a clever idea about some ministry that's not listed on there, write it in. We're good for write-ins, okay? What we're gonna be doing is over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be calling you and saying, you did these things, here's some thoughts. How, do we, how can we focus it? How can we get you plugged in to this thing that seems like this is what God has for you as a next step. Is that clear enough? Okay, so the rest of us now are going to take a minute and we're gonna pray and we're gonna take an offering and we're gonna do that kind of stuff, but if you haven't filled us out yet, please do, because when the baskets come by, we want you to just drop it in the basket, okay? All right, thank you. All right, this is offering time. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give our lives to you. Here's what's really cool about an offering. I think about this almost all the time when I do it. We think of it as money. It's not money. What it is is it's your life. You went to work and you spent a certain amount of time doing something. Maybe you liked it, maybe you didn't like it, but either way, the point is you put your life into something and for that, somebody gave you a paycheck. And what we're doing when we make an offering is we're not saying, God, here's some money. We're saying, God, I'm taking of that time. I'm taking of my life. I'm taking of this sustenance and this substance. And I am pouring this back into your kingdom. I'm tithing this. So Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those who do not have jobs, God, bring them jobs. Those that do, thank you. And in Jesus' holy and precious name, God, as we give today, we do not give money. We give our life. This is a way of saying, here, Lord, take this. Thank you in Jesus' holy and precious name. Go ahead and start passing that. And I didn't do communion, so I just really want to do communion. So would you guys just reach forward and would you grab your communion cups? And in the bottom cup is the bread and the top cup is the, is the, is the non-alcoholic wine. There you go, perfect, okay? Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, would you guys just wait just one second and then we'll do it. Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, we take this cup in which is the broken body of Christ, and we heard testimony of two people whose lives were not the fullness that you intended because of decisions they'd made which seemed very good and which the world put them in newspapers and wrote articles about them because they were exalting them so much. And yet their testimony is, my life was broken, and even though I had some sense of it, I never knew how much so. And then I came into a relationship with you, and now I'm getting it. And we're starting to see how much our lives are broken. So take that lower cup, would you? And just take your finger and just stick your finger inside that cup with the bread in it. Break that, would you? 
That's what I did to my life, God. And I know that what you did on the cross was make me whole. You healed all that was broken. You took all those decisions and all those issues upon yourself. You took them into the ground. You buried them. And you came back up whole. So in Jesus' name, take this body, this bread of life together. And now, Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, we lift up this cup in which is the life that you actually have for us, the one that is conformed to the image of Christ, the one that is filled with the abundance, the joy, the glory that is you. And so in Jesus' holy and precious name, having heard the testimony of two, our testimony is we want that. Ever more so. Thank you, God, that there's so many people in this congregation who have already made many of the steps that we talked about. Thank you, God, that no matter how many we've made, there's an infinite number more waiting for us. You are the deepest of oceans, the vastest vastness of space into which we go deeper and deeper. God, let our lives become conformed to the image of you, Jesus. Take together. Thank you, guys. Go ahead and pass it out.